Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsman from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville, coming to you on Friday of the 28th week in Ordinary Time, as always, here to praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ, that he may be better known and loved, and many may come to have eternal life doing that today by meditating on God's Word. Uh, and our first reading is Ephesians 1. We have turned the corner here in our first reading. We got done with Galatians on Wednesday, and we've started in on Ephesians. And then we're reading Luke in our Gospel reading. And both the first reading from Ephesians and the Gospel reading from Luke have a kind of what we might call truths in tension dynamic going on. Um, uh, two things that, that seem to be uh, kind of in conflict, at least to our human way of thinking, but really are resolved ultimately uh, from God's perspective. So our first reading, Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Brothers and sisters, in Christ we are also chosen, destined in accord with the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things according to the intention of his will so that we might exist for the praise of his glory, we who first hoped in Christ. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the first installment of our inheritance toward redemption as God's possession to the praise of his glory. All right, Ephesians is pretty complicated, and a lot of high-level theology is going on in this epistle. Uh, but I'm going to focus on something that St. Paul says at the beginning of this reading. He says, In Christ we were also chosen, destined in accord with the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things, etc., that we might exist for the praise of his glory. So St. Paul says, look, all of us Christians, we've been chosen and we have been predestined for lives that give glory to to God. And this is a doctrine that we call the doctrine of predestination. And many people associate this doctrine with Calvinism, which is the group that I came out of before I became Catholic. And that's true that John Calvin and his followers uh, were kind of obsessed with this doctrine and thought a lot about what it means that God would predestine people. But uh, it's, it's a hard thing to wrap our minds around. But this is what Paul is saying to each and every one of us, that God knew about us before we came to exist. That from the beginning of creation, God had in his mind John Bergsma, he had in his mind Joe Smith, Bill Wright, uh, whatever your name may be, whoever you are, he had each one of us in his mind, and he chose us from the beginning of creation, okay, to be his sons and daughters, and he has a plan for us in his plan of salvation. St. Paul affirms all of that, and we should believe all of that, and it should be a source of comfort to us. That, um, that God loves us so much that he chooses and calls us by name and has a plan for our life and, it's, and it has been present in God's mind because there's neither past nor future in God's mind, but this has been present in God's mind for eternity. Wow, that's amazing to think about. You know, God thought of me from all time. God has chosen me. God loves me. God has destined me for a life that glorifies him. Now the question, of course, is how do you reconcile that with our freedom? Don't we have free will? Uh, can't we um, make a choice uh, for God? And so on. And that is true. We do have free will. Um, well, how do you reconcile that with God choosing versus me having freedom? Well, that's the $100,000 question. And we're not going to get into all of that today. Uh, but I am going to uh, affirm both, even though they seem contradictory. Yes, we should affirm human freedom, and we should also affirm that God has chosen and destined us for his glory. And uh, there are different ways to try to make that work out. There's opinions among the Dominicans um, uh, who follow St. Thomas. They have a way of working this out. There's uh, also Molinists who are present, uh, who follow followers of a certain 
Spanish theologian Molina, who did a lot of writing about this issue, and and uh, the Jesuits in particular are fond of him. I believe he was a Jesuit, and uh, they follow his thought in this matter. We don't need to get into the complication of that. But what St. Paul wants us to hear today is be assured that God has known you from the beginning of creation and chosen you in particular, you with your name and who you are and your identity, that there are no nameless, faceless, generic people to God, um, no, no persons whose birth has surprised God, like, oh, I didn't see him coming. And that never happens to God, okay? Uh, he knows all of us from advance, which is why we have things, why we teach things like the sanctity of life. Okay, if God has known us in advance, then, then each unborn child is precious in the womb. What a terrible thing to say that, oh yeah, it should be legal to just rip up that little human being that was in the mind of God from all creation. You know, well, what, an, what an offense against the beauty. And there's other offenses against uh, the dignity of human beings as well. well how, sh- how can we treat any of our fellow human beings with disdain? Um, when they've been thought of in God's mind for all eternity. So let's have that assurance of God's love uh, for us. And let's move uh, to the gospel reading. Um, At that time, so many people were crowding together that they were trampling one another underfoot. And Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, beware of the leaven that is the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. This is what we were talking about on Wednesday. There is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in darkness will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be proclaimed on the housetops. Okay, uh, this is a solemn warning for all of us. Look, there are no secrets before God. All things are going to come to light. Everything we do in secret is going to be exposed before the face of God, at either at our particular judgment or at the final judgment, uh, there's there's no going to be no no hoodwinking God, and typically it's going to come out a lot to, lot lot before that, a lot longer before that, if that is an expression. Okay, uh, most of most of the stuff that we think we hide is is going to end up being exposed within our lifetime to other human beings. Okay, there's very very little that we're going to be able to keep a lid on until you know, the final judgment or something like that, or a particular judgment. Uh, most things are going to be exposed. So this is a exhortation, an exhortation to transparency for all of us. But I would add, in particular, for people who do church work. Okay? We used to have a, a saying, you know, uh, uh, in the neighborhood where I did urban ministry that, you know, there are no secrets in Coit neighborhood. This is the name of a neighborhood that I worked in, uh, in West Michigan. You know, no secrets in this neighborhood. You know, everybody's in each other's business. You know, so everything's going to get find, found out eventually. Well, the church is kind of like that, all right? Uh, everything gets found out in the church. Nothing remains a secret within the church for very long, sometimes longer than others. Some people are successful keeping the lid on something for a decade, maybe two decades, but stuff comes out in the church, right? So those who work in the church, whether you're a lay minister, whether you're a cleric, whatever, transparency. Don't think you're going to hide anything. Do I need to mention examples? Hopefully not. We've all seen too many examples in the news over the past decade now. It's been going on. More stuff comes to light all the time, okay? So transparency from the Pope to the most newly baptized infant, we need to live lives where our walk agrees with our talk and there's nothing hidden uh, in any recesses of our lives or our houses or our hard drives or whatever. Um, Okay, transparency. Then our Lord goes on and says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. But after that, who can do no more? All right, this would be various groups that would persecute the church, communists, Islamic groups, etc., that just outright kill Christians. Uh, Jesus says, don't worry about those socialists, those Muslims, etc., other persecutors that kill the body under persecution. But I shall show you whom to fear. Be afraid of the one who, after killing, has the power to cast into Gehenna. 
Who has that power? Well, that's God. Right? Yes, I tell you, be afraid of that one. Okay? So that's kind of like fear this. All right? You want something to be afraid of? Fear God. Does that sound strange? Well, the Old Testament says fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And that's why we're living in a foolish age, because people don't fear God because they don't believe he exists. And so they act like, we used to say act a fool, okay? That's what people do nowadays. They act a fool because the fool says in his heart there is no God, Psalm 14, okay? So um, that's the, the beginning of foolishness is not fearing God. The beginning of wisdom is fearing God. Really? Should I be scared of God? Well, this is interesting. Let's listen to what Jesus says next. Are not five sparrows sold for two small coins? Yet one of them has a, not one of them has escaped the notice of God. Even the hairs of your head have all been counted. Okay, so this sounds a lot like what St. Paul is saying in our first reading about God knowing us in advance, knowing our name, have a destiny for us, having a plan for us. Very much the same kind of thing. God knows us fully, all right? Even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So God knows how many hairs you have on your head. Think about that. And then Jesus goes on. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. What, Jesus? You just said to be afraid. You said be afraid of that one. In other words, be afraid of God. And now you're telling me do not be afraid of God. So which is it? Should I fear God or not? Yes. See all of the above, okay? Uh, that, like I said in the first reading, we have to hold in tension. The fact that, yes, we have free will, we, we make free choices, and yet God has chosen us in advance and has a plan for us. Okay? And we don't know exactly how to reconcile those two truths. I don't think we're going to reconcile that until we're in heaven. But, but the scriptures affirm both, and so we hold them both. I'm not saying that they are contradictory and that it's illogical. I'm just saying I don't have a logical solution. But I think we will understand it in the life to come. Now we're being asked to both fear God and not fear God. So what does this mean? Well, in a sense we fear God. In what sense do we fear God? We fear God's power and we recognize that he's fully just and so that gives us a healthy fear of doing what is unjust, of doing evil. And we recognize, no, we can't do that, because if we do that, then we're going to see, see the scary side of God. We go down that path, and you're going to see the scary side of God. You go down that path. Okay, so that's, that's healthy. Why should we not be afraid? Well, because God loves us. He's chosen us before the foundations of the world. Has a plan for his life. Counted all our hairs on our head. Knows how many... Uh, Base pairs are in our DNA. He knows every mutation in our genome, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And so that gives us great confidence. Wow, uh, God loves me so much. I can trust that he will give me the strength that I need to be saved, to work out my salvation. I can, I can pray to him. I can count on him, et cetera, to bring me into... Uh, his eternal dwelling places uh, to live with him forever. So we kind of hold those intention. Yeah, fear, fear God if I'm going to sin, fear God if I'm going to ignore him, etc. But, uh, but then great confidence in God because he loves me so much. And, and walking that balance between fear and love, this is, this is the balance of the Christian life. This is the tightrope of the path of discipleship to keep those uh, both in view and, um, uh, and not neglect either because there's important truths in, in both ways. Ultimately, it's love, though, right? We get to our, holy, uh, to our heavenly home and uh, where it will no longer be possible to, to sin. And then we just bathe in the abyss of God's love. That'll be nice. <laughs> Here the water's, water's pretty comfortable. So, uh, this has been Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville coming to you on this Friday of the 28th week of Ordinary Time. Till next time, God bless you richly.